Hook that up to mechanical arms and legs and give them the gift of life once again. You know that Christopher Reeve, the handsome actor who played Superman in the Superman movies, he was paralyzed from the neck down. He died a few years ago. But unfortunately, he died before we perfected the exoskeleton. We now have the ability to create Iron Man. And in the movie Surrogates with Bruce Willis, it's possible that the mind can control a robot, an avatar. This could be the future of the space program. One day we might put an astronaut, a robot astronaut on the moon, very cheap, because robots do not require much maintenance, they don't complain, they don't bellyache, they don't go on strike, and most important, they don't have to come back. <laughs> the robot is controlled by an astronaut sitting in his hot tub in California, mentally controlling the robot. These are called surrogates. And then, telekinesis. The ability to move objects with the mind. This is the movie Carrie by Stephen King. Carrie is a young girl who is bullied throughout her high school years. And on the senior prom, she decides to destroy everybody. What's the lesson here? The lesson is never take a telekinetic to the senior prom. <laughs> and in the latest Superman movie, every child knows that Superman's father died when Krypton blew up. Everybody knows this. But in the recent Superman movie, Superman's father comes back, comes back to life as Russell Crowe. <laughs> Russell Crowe is a hologram. A hologram that looks and acts like Superman's father, but has the memory, the sensation, the emotions of the father which is a computer program. The connectome of Superman's father is in a computer, operates a hologram, and Superman's father comes back to life. In the future, we could have a library of souls. You go to the library today, and you read about Winston Churchill. Wouldn't it be great to go to the library and actually talk to Winston Churchill? Ask him questions? joke with them, laugh with them, because his connectome is preserved in the library. I wouldn't mind having a conversation with Albert Einstein. This could be possible if we have the connectome. And then, of course, the mind versus the body. Is it possible to separate the mind and the body? Well, historically, there was something called dualism. Historically, hundreds of years ago, during the Middle Ages, People said that the soul is different from the body. That's called dualism. But in the last 50 years, we have neuroscience. Neuroscience tells us that the mind is software. The mind is software running on wetware. Wetware called gray matter. But now if we have the genome and the connectome, we are going back to the Middle Ages back to the Middle Ages, where the mind is separate from the body. So, let's now talk not about Hollywood movies, let's talk about physics. I'm a physicist. We shoot radio right through the brain, painless, and we look for echoes, echoes of blood flow, echoes of oxygen, which traces the neural pathways, and we can actually see thoughts Thoughts ricocheting in the brain like a ping pong ball. On the left, for example, is your brain when it tells the truth. Nothing much happens. But when you tell a lie, ah uh, yes, when you tell a lie. First, you have to know the truth. Then you have to create a lie. Then you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the lies you've been telling all these years. That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree when you tell a lie. <laughs> so let's now say a few things about what we know about the brain today. The brain consists of three parts, three parts. The back of the brain is the oldest part of the brain, the reptilian brain. 
the brain of a reptile. And the lower right is the back of the brain, the ancient brain. When you have a car accident and you have whiplash, that's where the injury takes place. It affects your balance. The central part of the brain is the monkey brain, the brain of emotions, the limbic system, the brain of social hierarchy, manners, learning how to function in a monkey society. And the very left is the most advanced, the prefrontal cortex. That is the thinking brain on the left. And when a child is born, the brain grows from the back, through the middle, to the front, mimicking evolution. And we can now test old wives' tales, because we can now see energy flows inside the brain. There's one old wives' tale. Every parent knows. Every parent knows that their children suffer from brain damage. Yes, teenagers suffer from brain damage. Every parent knows that. It's true. You can actually show that in teenagers, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. It's true, this old wives' tale. Another old wives' tale is, when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Brain scans have conclusively shown that when a man talks to a pretty girl, blood drains from the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> he becomes mentally retarded. <laughs> and we can measure this. Conclusive proof of old wives' tales about the brain. The brain also has two halves, the left half and the right half. And if you cut, if you cut the link between the left half and the right half in epileptics, you have to save their life, otherwise they die of convulsions. So you cut the connection. But when you separate the left brain from the right brain, something bizarre, something weird really happens. What happens is, this has been documented many times, two distinct personalities, two different minds begin to emerge in the same skull. One gentleman was recorded when he greeted his wife he greeted his wife with his left hand. With his right hand, he socked her in the face. <laughs> there was another gentleman whose left brain claimed that he was an atheist. He did not believe in God. But the right brain did believe in God. And so you can imagine, when he dies, does half his brain go to heaven <laughs> and the other half of the brain not go to heaven? And in the future, I am sure that we're going to find an epileptic whose left brain is Republican, <laughs> and right brain is Democrat. And when they go to the polling booth and he has to vote, the two hands will struggle <laughs> as to where to put the lever. I'm sure that will also happen. So the mind is a very mysterious thing. Now, back in the 1950s, this is how we analyzed the brain. Very clumsy, looking for radio electrical emissions from the brain using these helmets. But today, we have MRI scans, also headbands. You can put a headband which picks up the radio emitted from your brain. On the left, you can now play video games. Video games can now be done totally by thinking about them because of this headband. On the upper right, this is the rage of Japan. In Japan, when you go to a party, they give you a headband with two ears on it. When you talk to someone who's interesting, the two ears light up. When you talk to someone who's boring, the two ears go in, like that. So in Japan, you always know if you're going to go home alone after the party by yourself. <laughs> And in my class, when I teach physics, I'm going to make sure that all my students wear this so I know who's going to get the A and who's going to get the F. And in the lower left, Silicon Valley has heard about this. They're experimenting, experimenting with laptops that are driven by the mind. So you don't need a cursor anymore. 
You simply think, think, and the thing moves. So in the future, when you walk into a room, you might mentally turn on the lights, mentally turn on the internet, mentally surf the web, mentally type letters, write letters, write email, ha operate household appliances like the toaster and the oven, even call for your car and drive your car mentally just by thinking about it. And Madison Avenue has heard about this. Madison Avenue is even thinking about making an ad campaign, making this fashionable. And my colleague Stephen Hawking, a great cosmologist, now lost control of his fingers. He can no longer communicate with the world except by blinking. But hey, all of his friends were all physicists. So we equipped Stephen Hawking with a chip connected to a laptop. It's in his right glass. Look at his right glass. The next time you see him on television, look at his right frame. There's a chip there. That chip is an antenna. It picks up brain waves, and he's allowed to communicate with the laptop computer. So Stephen now communicates with the world mentally. And an even better way is to put a chip directly on the brain itself. This is being pioneered by the military, also at Brown University, Johns Hopkins University. We're talking about taking people who are totally paralyzed. On the left is a man who had a massive stroke. He is totally paralyzed. He cannot scratch his nose. He cannot turn around in bed. A nurse has to be with them for every single bodily motion. So at Brown University, they put a chip in his brain, connected the chip to a laptop computer, and connected the laptop computer to a wheelchair. Then to the internet. He can now surf the web, read email, write email, play video games, operate his wheelchair, operate household appliances like a toaster, and he is totally paralyzed. And the military has heard about this. There are thousands of wounded warriors from Iraq and Afghanistan. At Brown, they've hooked up this woman, who is also totally paralyzed, to a mechanical arm. She can now move just like you can move an arm. And at Johns Hopkins University, they have these mechanical arms and mechanical legs funded by the United States Pentagon. So we're talking about Iron Man. These arms are the most advanced ever developed, developed by the military at Johns Hopkins. You can pick up an egg and not shatter the egg mentally. And a complete exoskeleton with arms, with legs connected by the brain was developed at Duke University, and that's what started the soccer games this summer. This was a coming out, a coming out of the fact that we can now create Iron Man. And we can also create what are called surrogates. That is, the mind can control a robot. This could be the future of the space program. It could also be the future of firemen. It's dangerous to go into a fire. Every year, some fireman loses his life running into a fire. Why not have a person control a robot? Police work, firemen work, astronauts, all of them can be done by surrogates. And surrogates could one day replace the classroom. This surrogate has your face in it. Now, when we were young, fess up, when we were young, we played hooky, right? You talk to your mom, and you said, Mom, I don't want to go to school today. And then you forge your signature. Little Jimmy cannot go to school today because he's sick, right? Remember those days? They're gone. Because in the future, when you're sick in bed, your surrogate photographs you, and you see the image of your teacher. The teacher sees a surrogate sitting in your chair with your image on it. Isn't the future wonderful? You will never play hooky ever again. Your attendance record will be 100% in the future. 
And since the eye is connected to the brain, the simplest way to input messages into the brain is through contact lenses. This is the future of the internet. The future of the internet is to be in your contact lens. You will blink and you will go online. And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> College students, not here of course. College students will blink and see all the answers right there in their contact lens. Who's the second person to buy internet contact lenses? President Barack Obama. So he doesn't have to have these damn teleprompters giving him his speech. Who's the third person to buy internet contact lenses? Vice President Joe Biden. So he never says anything goofy anymore. <laughs> He's always on message. Who are the next persons to buy internet contact lenses? Tourists. If you are in Rome looking for the remnants of the Roman Empire, well, there isn't any. It's all gone, almost. In the future, as you walk through the ruins of the Forum, you'll see the Roman Empire resurrected in your contact lens. The entire majesty of the Roman Empire right there in your contact lens. And then if you want to buy something in the bazaar, you'll talk to the merchants in English. They'll see translations into Italian, and you'll buy things by looking at your contact lens. In other words, in the future, when you look at somebody, your contact lens will identify who they are and print a biography next to their name. And if they speak Chinese to you, your contact lens will translate Chinese into English and give subtitles underneath their image. For example, how many times have you been at a conference like this? And you meet a fellow classmate, and you say, who is this person? I mean, Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. In the future, your contact lens will say, it's Jim, stupid. <laughs> you see him every year at this event. You want to see his complete biography? And let's say you're graduating from this great university, and you're at a cocktail party. And there's some very important recruiters at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> so this is going to change everything. We're going to have exoskeletons, we'll have surrogates, we'll have avatars. We're going to be able to basically digitalize the human body. And Last year, a breakthrough was made which made world history. For the first time in history, we were able to record a memory, upload it, and remember the memory. This was done at Wake Forest University, North Carolina, and also the University of Southern California. They took a mouse, and on the upper left, you see the hippocampus. It's a small little organ about that big that records memories. They put electrodes on either end, shown here. And when the mouse learns something like sipping water, they tape record it. Tape recorded the impulses traveling across the hippocampus. Then the mouse forgot how to do this. And then they reinserted the tape recording into the brain. And the mouse, bingo, first try remember how to do it. Next will come monkey trials. Monkeys will perhaps eat a banana, will record the memory of that, and insert it maybe into another monkey. And what's the short-term goal? To treat Alzheimer's. On the upper right is a brain pacemaker. That's the short-term goal. In the future, when all these old people begin to lose their memory, They'll be wandering the streets, not knowing who they are. They'll have a brain pacemaker. You push a button, you push a button, and it inserts the memory of where you live and who you are. And this could be the way you study for final exams in the future. <laughs> you push the button, and you learn calculus. 
You push the button and you have the vacation that you never had. This is not possible today. We can only record snippets of memory, but I think it's coming. The ability to record and upload memories just like in The Matrix. And then we can do something that's even more fantastic. We can photograph a thought. At Berkeley, where I got my PhD years and years ago, they've now taken MRI photographs of the brain, decoded 30,000 points of blood flow in an MRI scan. So you MRI scan the brain, reduce it to 30,000 dots me measuring blood flow. You put that into a computer, and what you get? A picture. On the upper left is Steve Martin, the actor. Next to Steve Martin is a picture reconstructed in the memory of a computer of a thought. We can now see what you were thinking. On the upper left is an elephant. Next to that is the image of the elephant taken by a computer as it scans your brain. And when you fall asleep, when you fall asleep in the MRI machine, the MRI machine keeps on going, and what does it do? It prints out your dream. This was once considered preposterous. Hey, we do it now. One day, you push a button, and you see the dream that you had the previous night. And there are old wives' tales about dreams, many old wives' tales. There's something called lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is when you are awake while you dream. You can control the direction of your dream. You are aware that you were dreaming. It can actually control the direction of that dream. I've done it a few times. Lucid dreaming, raise your hand. How many people here have had episodes of lucid dreaming? Yeah, about a third of you. It's true. In Germany, at Leipzig University, they actually put a lucid dreamer in an MRI scan and they showed that he was conscious while he was dreaming. We can actually prove that lucid dreaming is no longer an old wives tale. Back on the internet, type in lucid dreaming. There are Buddhist texts, centuries old, teaching you how to do it. There are lessons about how to do lucid dreaming. When you wake up in the morning, you have two minutes. Two minutes to jot down the dream before it disappears. And just before you go to bed at night, you have to mentally say to yourself, I will control my dream. And after a few weeks, you are a lucid dreamer. And now, the big one. Why is President Barack Obama and the European Union dumping a billion dollars to create the next big crash program after the Genome Project? to cure and understand mental illness. Mental illness is one of the greatest afflictions of the human race. One percent of us are schizophrenic, and 15 percent of us have episodes of depression severe enough to require help. The Bible mentions mental illness. So the question is, what is mental illness? Well, schizophrenics hear voices. When you put a schizophrenic in a brain scan, for the first time, we now know what madness is. The left part of your brain generates voices when you talk to yourself. Everybody talks to themselves. You're talking to yourself right now. The left part of your brain talks to itself. The front part of the brain, of course, knows that you're talking to yourself. In schizophrenics who hear voices, we see that the left part of the brain lights up without permission of the front part of the brain. They are talking to themselves without their permission. Now, if one day you heard a voice that was not your own, you'd say to yourself, I'm going mad. That's what madness is. Madness is a miswiring of the brain. When the front part of the brain does not talk 
to the left part of the brain properly, that is called schizophrenia. And we can now begin to analyze historical figures through the lens of modern neuroscience. Joan of Arc was perhaps one of the greatest woman warriors in all of history. But Joan of Arc is a mystery. Some people say she was schizophrenic. No, the transcripts of her trial by the British are known. You can look them up on the internet right now on your cell phone. They show a very sharp, very articulate woman, not schizophrenic. There's something else. It turns out that if you suffer from epileptic lesions, about 10, 20% of people who suffer from epileptic lesions come down with hyper-religiosity. They are super religious. When it rains, when you fall down, it was meant to be that way. It's a punishment because the gods are angry at you. These people see the hand of God everywhere. The slightest rainfall, the slightest mishap, it's all due to God's will. That's hyper-religiosity. And we can actually induce some of it electrically with a helmet. We can create a helmet that shoots radio into a certain part of the left temporal lobe and you become super religious. You begin to think that you're in the presence of God. So scientists got this helmet. We call it the God helmet. <laughs> and we put an atheist and a Catholic nun inside the God helmet. For the atheist, they chose Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a famous biologist at Oxford, also an atheist. And after he had radio zapped into his brain, they asked him, did you feel God? And he said, well, yeah, he sort of felt that way, but hey, it's just radio. Then they put a Catholic nun into this device to see whether it would shake her beliefs. And she said, no. She felt like she was talking to God. But you see, God meant it that way. God created a radio, a connection, a telephone between our brain and heaven. It was meant to be that way. You know, you can't win. <laughs> neither, per neither person changed their religious points of view. And then, for me, this was the greatest mystery of all. Super geniuses. Why is it that some people have photographic memories? This person here on the left took a helicopter ride over New York City Harbor. And then on a sheet of paper, about 50 feet long, he drew the entire landscape of Manhattan from memory. Try it sometime. <laughs> Take a sheet of paper, see a picture of the Empire State Building in Manhattan, and draw all of it from memory. One helicopter ride. You can see it. It's at JFK Airport, Terminal 1. Next time you're at JFK Airport, go to Terminal 1, look up, and you'll see this huge mural painted by this man from memory, from one helicopter ride. And he's also done Hong Kong, he's also done London from memory. And we also have mathematical geniuses. One child had a bullet that went through his left temporal lobe. Another gentleman dove into his swimming pool and hit his head on the left side of the brain on the bottom of the pool. Both of them wound up as super mathematical geniuses. It's possible to have injuries to the left temporal lobe and become a genius. Now, after today's lecture, do not pick up a hammer. <laughs> do not pick up a hammer and beat yourself on the left temporal lobe, hoping that you're going to pass, pass that math exam tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. However, we have looked seriously as some of the greatest scientists who ever lived. The greatest scientist who ever lived said out Einstein. Einstein himself said that the greatest scientist who ever lived 
was Isaac Newton. But Isaac Newton was a very strange man. He was incapable of small talk. He's not the kind of person you want to invite to dinner. He had no friends, male or female, never married. Basically, he kept to himself and worked out the theory of gravity, the nature of light, the binomial theorem, calculus. In fact, he created calculus at the rate at which you learn it in Math 1. Why? Well, we think, though we cannot prove, he suffered from Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's syndrome is a mild form of autism. Many of them have photographic memories. Many of them can perform incredible mathematical feats. And if you want to see somebody who suffers from Asperger's syndrome, watch The Big Bang Theory on CBS television. That's what Asperger's syndrome looks like. Clueless. Clueless when it comes to women. Clueless when it comes to small talk. Remind you of anybody you know? And then, the greatest genius of modern times, Albert Einstein. His brain we now have. We have his brain. When Einstein died in 1955, the doctor who performed the operation held Einstein's brain in his hand, and he had this existential shock, realizing the greatest genius of modern times his brain was sitting in his hand. So what did he do? He took it home. <laughs> he took it home, put it in a mayonnaise jar for about 40 years. It was sitting underneath his, his beer cooler. And he even drove across the country with Einstein's brain in the back seat of his Buick. Finally, he donated the brain to Princeton Hospital. At Princeton Hospital, we have Einstein's brain. It is different. First of all, it's smaller than normal. So you see, there's hope for us. <laughs> Einstein's brain is actually smaller than normal, but certain parts of it are thicker. And you can find out more about the results in my book. But we can also re-examine Freudian psychology. Sigmund Freud had all these cockamamie ideas about the brain, but not all of them were wrong. Now for the first time, we can actually see where certain parts of the thing of the brain light up. Like the ego. The ego is you. You are the ego. It sits right behind your forehead. That's the prefrontal cortex. Your id, your pleasure center, is dead center. The nucleus accumbens lights up. Dead center in the brain, the pleasure center. And the superego, your guilty conscience, is right behind your eyes. We can see these things now. And in fact, uh, experiments have been done on the pleasure center. If you take a mouse, you put two electrodes in the mouse brain, you stimulate the pleasure center, and connect the electrodes to a telegraph key, so the mouse can hit the telegraph key and stimulate its pleasure center. The mouse will hit the key two times a second until he dies of starvation. We've done this with dogs, cats. Many animals will starve to death rather than stop stimulating their pleasure center. So scientists went up the scale to the porpoise. They hooked up a porpoise. The porpoise's brain is bigger than our brain. The porpoise can swim forward and hit a telegraph key and stimulate his pleasure center. Well, the porpoise would hit the electrode stimulating his pleasure center. And then, finally, the porpoise would say to itself, I am dying. I will die. I'm not eating any food at all. So the porpoise will stop, go and eat, and then come back and say, <laughs> The porpoise is not stupid after all. <laughs> and then, consciousness itself. I don't have time to go into it, but consciousness has been the subject of 20,000 scientific papers with no conclusion, no way of measuring it. 20,000 papers have been written about consciousness. Never in the history of science have so many devoted so much to produce so little. But in my book, I actually give you a definition of consciousness. 
and a metric by which you can measure it. I'm a physicist, I'm not a philosopher. We define things, we measure things, we introduce a metric by which we can rank things. That's what we physicists do, rather than philosophize about things. Many books say that consciousness is self-awareness. But then what is self-awareness? Well, that's consciousness. And Robert Frost gave a definition of consciousness. Robert Frost said that consciousness begins when you wake up in the morning and ends when you enter your office. <laughs> well, I believe that the smallest unit, the smallest unit, one unit of consciousness is one feedback loop, like a thermostat. A thermostat measures the temperature of the room. That's all it does. I say it has one unit of consciousness. A flower has maybe 10 units. It measures humidity, temperature, sunlight, carbon dioxide. A flower may have 10 units. And level one consciousness is animals, reptiles. Remember the back of the brain? The back of the brain is the most ancient part <coughs> of your brain. It measures distance, space. So I say level one consciousness, which has maybe a hundred feedback loops, measures space. And then we have the monkey brain, the social brain, the brain of good manners, deferring to your elders, the brain of emotions. That's the center of the brain. I call that level two consciousness. And then here's the big one. What separates human consciousness from animal consciousness? What is it that makes us human? I say we have level three consciousness. We see time. We understand tomorrow. We plan, scheme, strategize. If you have a dog or a cat, go home tonight and try to teach your dog or a cat tomorrow. And you'll find that you can't. You see, animals have a totally different consciousness than us. How many people here, for example, have a cat? Raise your hand if you have a cat. And when you come home, the cat comes up to you, purrs next to you, right? And then, hmm, stomps off, right? Why do cats do that? Well, you think, oh, nice cat. Cat is so affectionate, comes up to you. Wrong. <laughs> the cat is rubbing a hormone on your leg, saying, I own this human. <laughs> this human is mine. Other cats stay away from my property. I've trained this human. This human feeds me three times a day. I've trained him really well. And then why do cats oh, go off into the distance? It's because they are sparing with their affection. They want to play hard to get. No. Cats are descended from the wild cat. They are solitary hunters. They hunt all by themselves. That's why they go off. Oh, by themselves. It has nothing to do with playing hard to get, nothing to do with affection. And how many people here in the audience have a dog? Raise your hand. Even more have a dog. Well, when you come home, your dog rushes up to you and slobbers all over you, right? Why? And if you kick the dog, God forbid, you kick the dog, the dog goes, ear, 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 and then just slinkers off, right? Why is that? Because the dog is descended from Canis Lupus. The gray wolf. The dog thinks that you are a dog. Except you are top dog. You are the alpha male. What holds a tribe of wolves together? The alpha male. And when the alpha male walks in, what do the beta wolves do? The beta wolves all lower their head. And why do they lower their head? To show deference to the alpha male? No. To expose the neck. The neck is the most vulnerable part of the human body. You squash the neck, you die. That's why the wolf, the beta wolf, will bow their head when the alpha wolf, wolf comes in. The beta wolves are saying, I trust you. You are my master. You can kill me anytime, but I trust you because you are my leader. So that's why your dog bows to you when you come home. It thinks you are the alpha male. Stupid dog. <laughs> so 
God thinks that you are a God. So that's what humans do. Humans see the future. Now, of course, animals hibernate. But when they hibernate, it's instinct. Almost all the behavior, not all, but almost all the behaviors of an animal are instinctual rather than what we do is plan. So that's what separates human consciousness from animal consciousness. And then, what about robots? Well, let's rank consciousness of robots. My scale, you can rank the consciousness of anything, starting from a thermostat all the way up to Albert Einstein. Well, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Asimo here is the world's smartest robot, built in Japan. Asimo can run, walk, climb up stairs, and even dance. In fact, it dances much better than me. I've been on several specials with Asimo and out dances me every time. So for BBC television, I interviewed the creator of Asimo for national television. And I asked him, how smart is the world's smartest robot? And then the creator said, and I paraphrase, he said, Asimo, my creation has the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach, <laughs> a lobotomized, retarded, dim-witted cockroach. The robots you see on television, you've been brainwashed. There's a human behind them. There's a remote control, a joystick that controls the robots you see in the movies and the robots you see on television. So Japan is building these robots to create robot nurses, not much more. The robots of today have the intelligence of a bug, but just enough to lift patients in a hospital and to take care of them. Not much more. So, then the next question is, why are the politicians doing this, dumping so much money to create the Connect Home, and what are we going to do with it? First, cure mental illness, as I mentioned. We can now see what part of the brain is malfunctioning when you have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. That's when you wash your hands until your skin comes off. We can actually see bipolar disorder. Many famous actors and actresses had bipolar disorder. When you see the movie uh, Gone with the Wind, a scholar of O'Hara, in real life, she had bipolar disorder. It ruined her life because she would oscillate between manic episodes and depressive episodes. And Margot Kidder, the, the woman who played Lois Lane in the Superman movies, she also suffered from bipolar disorder. Several years ago, it was in all the papers, they found her stark naked, hiding behind trash cans as if she was a homeless woman. She later admitted that yes, she has uh, bipolar disorder. So the politicians want to cure that. But you see, I'm a physicist. I realize that there's something more that we can do, and that is we can send the connect home into outer space. If you have somebody's consciousness on a disk, why not put it on a laser beam and send it to the moon? That'd be the quickest way to explore the universe at the speed of light. For example, it takes one second one second for a laser beam to go from the Earth to the Moon. If we send the Connect Home to the Moon, there's no booster rockets, no accidents, no life support, no spacesuits. You just send the light beam to the Moon. To go to Mars takes 20 minutes. 20 minutes to go to Mars. To go to the nearest star, <coughs> four years to go to the nearest star. And in fact, who knows, maybe in our galaxy, it already exists. Maybe the aliens in outer space have already created a laser network whereby they shoot the connect home at the speed of light from star system to star system. That would be the simplest way to colonize the universe. And then the next question that everyone asks is, well, if there are aliens out there, how come they don't land on the White House lawn? and announce their existence. Here we are, folks, on the White House lawn. Well, if they can reach us, they're thousands of years more advanced than us. So if you're walking down a country road and you see an anthill, do you go down to the ants and say, I bring you trinkets, I bring you beads, I give you nuclear energy, 
take me to your aunt queen. Is that what you see me there? Or do you have this politically incorrect urge to step on a few of them? Well, maybe that's why they don't land on the White House lawn. Maybe we're simply not that interesting to them. Now, let me end on a final note, and I'll take questions. And afterwards, I'll sign your book. I will sign your book. And after I sign your book, you can go to eBay and auction that book off for money. <laughs> yes, my signature is worth money. You can make money today. Well, let me end on the following note. When I was a child, I had a role model. My role model was Albert Einstein. And let me tell you my favorite Einstein story. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. Everybody wanted the same talk. So one day, his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor Einstein, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times. I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I will be the great Einstein. You can put on my cap and uniform and be my chauffeur. So they switched places. This went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much.